Hello, my name is Joshua Harris with Urban Plain, and today we are in Hyde Park, Chicago, a historic neighborhood on Chicago's south side. Today we'll be meeting with Patrick McCoy, a world-class art collector, and we will learn about how he founded Diaspora Rhythms, an organization predicated on promoting artworks of artists of African descent. Patrick McCoy was born on December 20th, 1946 in Chicago, Illinois. He graduated as class valedictorian from Inglewood High School in 1946 and received his bachelor's degree in chemistry from the University of Chicago. He would worked with the Air and Radiation Division of the United States Environmental Protection Agency in Chicago for nearly three decades before retiring in 2006 and embarking on a new adventure centered around his passion for visual art. McCoy co-founded Diaspora of Rhythms in 2003 and serves as the president of the organization's board of directors. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Patrick McCoy. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Yes, I'm, I'm doing quite well. I'm okay. doing quite well. Okay. Uh, well, before we get started with our questions, I would like to ask you, um, how does the art world in Chicago relate to the larger Midwest? And can you talk about a couple of the more notable relationships that you built through your co through your art collecting um, background? That's a big question. That's <laughs> all the questions are there. Uh, the first part of it, how does the art world uh, in Chicago relate to them? That which is the larger Midwest. And the larger Midwest. Well, and what is, it is a, the capital of what is going on in the Midwest. Is that it is the, the low side for uh, most of the major activities. Is it, my understanding is that the three major art centers of this country is New York, Chicago, and Santa Fe, Santa Fe New Mexico's for the art market. So it is, if you look at that larger one, it is at the, it's in the forefront of, of that. Now, the art market that I, and the art world that I work in, which is the, the African-American one, is Chicago is very similar to the other Midwest cities, uh, Milwaukee, Minnesota, Detroit, Cleveland, and so forth, and that uh, there's a lot of activity that's going on, has always gone on, but it's been under the radar for the larger, larger society. It just doesn't realize the amount and the quality of the artwork that is being produced in the African American world. At Chicago, being what the largest of those cities, has a very large uh, African American art world. I would I would say Detroit is uh, kind of right there with it because they they've kind of ex gone from being the motor city to being very interested in promoting the visual arts in that city. Milwaukee, uh, the Wisconsin uh, art community is very vibrant. It we have a relationship with uh, some of the people in that in that world. Uh, St. Louis, we, Chicago, yeah, I think just by numbers has the, a bigger one, but I think they all are about the same in the sense of the way that they relate to the, the communities that they are found in, is that they are doing things and most of it is not being, not being recognized. Can you talk about the relationship that you built in Chicago or look in the larger Midwest as well? See, that, that would make me have to have a big head. <laughs> Is that, uh, the relationship that I've built, I, it almost sounds as though it's a, an activity that I'm consciously trying to do. And that is not correct. Is that I'm not consciously trying to create uh, a relationship uh, of prominence with, within that. I've been actively operating as an art collector. And that's in relationship to the way that I define art collector. And that is someone that looks at and sees something and they like it. And I have no problem going out into the world and looking at things. And if I see something I like, I will then inquire whether it is available for sale. And if I can afford it, I'll get it. That to me is an art collector. So that is the activity that I've been doing for 50 plus years. Didn't realize it in total until around 2000, that that is exactly what I was doing. Uh, because I was up until around the 2000, I was operating under a pattern of thought that I was not an art collector, that 
that activity that I just described to you was not would not qualify me as an art collector is that I was operating under uh, a mindset that an art collector is inherently somebody that's rich. And that in order to claim that you're an art collector, you have to have a lot of money. And that because art is very, very expensive. That was what I was thinking. Uh, I also believe that if you were using the term to describe yourself as an art collector, that you're activity and your persona was one of privacy and security that you did not want people to know what you had uh, because they'll come and try to steal it. <laughs> and, so, and so I was believing that because I saw so many people in the media that were always operating as that, oh, you can't come and see what I have. Now, and that's never been who I am. I've always had my drone, but I love people. And I, I definitely like people to see what I have. I, and so I didn't share that quality that I believed that an art collector had. The third thing I believed, which was totally erroneous, was that you had to know something about art in order to be an art collector. In fact, you had to be academic. You had to be encyclopedic in your knowledge of art. You had to know everything that's ever gone. You've read every book. I knew every artist by name. And I went to school to study chemistry. So I was, I was not thinking that I did not take classes for it. So that was the third strike that just said, well, I'm not an art collector. And the fourth one was that I believed that if, if you say you're an art collector, you had to be very interested in the economic and value of art. You are doing it quasi as an investment concept. And that that is very, very important as you make these decisions about acquiring things and that you have some sort of knowledge you know that oh in 10 years this is going to be worth x y and z and i could care less <laughs> so i i with those four strikes i like oh i'm not an art collector and it was only until around the year 2000 that i questioned my thinking and found out that it was false that it was uh not correct and that it's a part of a larger uh, misconception a myth about art collecting and even the art world itself that is i believe a very detriment to its actual existence is that it is not an activity that's an elitist activity it's not an activity that is only for the rich it is not an activity that re that requires you to know anything and that you you can uh, you can be a very uh, active and involved art collector and never be concerned about what the value of these things are because they are valuable, they are priceless to you and your feeling about them. That's the, to me is the most important part. So I didn't do what, it, what you start, your question started out. I didn't go about trying to establish uh, a reputation or a, rep, a relationship to the art world uh, by operating as an art collector the way I used to think of an art collector, I did not do that. What I did is that I freed myself from those misconceptions and I just worked on the very simple principle that if you see something you like, you can do it. If you can get it, then you just get it. And if you keep doing that, you will accumulate a very, very important collection. Now, what made me get to that point? Well, what I did, I had an epiphany. I was thinking about culture in all of its manifestations. Art, music, dance, literature, poetry, fashion, all of those things make up our culture. And I was just talking about one, the visual arts. And so when I started thinking about the others, I recognized there is no per perception or understanding that they are going to be elitist, that they actually are very egalitarian. In fact, the music aspect of culture is the most egalitarian thing in it. Everybody's involved in appreciating music. Everybody effectively is a music collector. And we inherently share music. 
is that it's not something you ever want to hold to yourself, is that you inherently want to share. And then the, the kicker was, you don't have to know what they have to think about music. <laughs> In order to appreciate it, to collect it, to talk about it, to be a, a strong uh, uh, fan or a uh, critic of it, you don't have to know anything about how to play anything, sing anything, uh, beat on it. You don't have to know none of that. So it was when I recognized, like, why do we have these perceptions in the visual arts field when we don't have them in the other parts of the culture where everybody has access to it everybody everybody can if they want to learn how to dance or appreciate dance uh, go to dance uh, uh, pass up to theater for poetry to literature not collect but he said we don't have that concept uh that you can't be this unless you are this so when I recognized that, I said, okay, something's wrong with the visual arts culture. I, it's not that those things are right, those things are wrong, but we're, what, we believe, what we have tended to believe. They're wrong, we have to change that. And that's, uh, that set me on a path. Uh, and I think one of your questions deals with that. You said, what would bring about me actually becoming an activist to actually want to go beyond just collecting and appreciating the art, but to actually want to change things. Uh, once I saw how wrong those perceptions that I had, and, and when I talked to people, I find out they have the same thoughts. They believe that you have to be an elitist. It's, it's, a, it's a rich man's game. Uh, you got to know all this kind of stuff, and you got to be as concerned about investment. People talk about it all the time, and I just, that's not correct. But um, when I saw what it's doing to our culture, African-American visual art culture, I said, we got to change that because that's, that's not correct. One, it damages the culture by not allowing it to thrive. Uh, the visual artists in our community do not get the benefit that our musical artists get. Is that you get a huge audience for music, and you got this really small set of people that really pay attention to the visual arts? I said that's wrong. That has to be changed because the visual arts are very important. In fact, between music, I mean between sight and sound, I mean which one is the most important? Uh, sight is really up there. <laughs> so I feel like that we are damaging ourselves by limiting our ability to look and acquire and to have visual imagery in our lives that support, encourage, uh, question us and so forth, uh, hold us up. So most people are shying away from thinking of themselves and acting as art collectors because of these misconceptions. So I, with a couple of other people, decided we better change that in our community. We can, might not be able to do it, everybody, but we're gonna start doing something in the African-American community. Patrick has accumulated a personal collection of over a thousand pieces of artwork over the last several decades. We had an incredible opportunity to tour his home and check out some of the incredible pieces and hear a few of the stories associated with his immaculate assembly of work. Um, all of my rooms in my uh, apartment have themes for the collection. Um, in fact, there's multiple themes in the, in, the, in the living room, but this room, uh, the theme of it is about the problems of black men in America and the solutions. And so I divided the room up underneath this light fixture. Uh, so on this side of the light fixture, there's all kinds of problems that have plagued black men in America. And then on this side, on uh, my understanding of the solutions to those problems. And, um, so this wall was just really where I started. And I started with this piece right here, which is called Gang Bang. And I saw this piece at an art fair. It was a single piece. And I was like, wow, this is so very powerful because it's called Gang Bang. But this is the person that's out there in the street doing it. And he's at, in the lockup, and he's locked up against the wall. And yet there's, there's these faces in his pants. 
So I, I, I said, oh, he's resting on his homies that are supposed to be coming to get him. And we can see with that lock, they ain't gonna come. <laughs> Thank you all for tuning in. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for more awesome content like this.